Hello and welcome to ultrasoundvillage.com. My name is Greg Sweetman. Over the course of the next 20 minutes, we're going to be talking around hypovolemia and its assessment with bedside echo. This lecture will be integrated and complementary to others on the site. It's been repeatedly shown that in the critically ill patient, the use of echocardiography leads to a change in diagnosis and a change in hemodynamic management, more importantly, in some 40 to 60% of the cases. And assessment of the volume status of the patient is an integral part of this assessment. The scope of this presentation will be to build on well-established concepts that are currently running in courses both nationally and internationally, such as the heart scan, feel, rush, to name a few. The scope of this particular talk will be around how development of volume assessment has progressed in ultrasound, uh, the measurement of the IVC and determining IVC collapsibility, and as an adjunct, how the JVP can be measured using ultrasound. Aspects of left ventricular volume and its change with volume status will not be covered in this course, but is covered in others in this series. If we look at early studies, we see that non-invasive estimation of right atrial pressure as a function of inspiratory collapse of the inferior vena cava was known some 20 years ago. And as evidence of this, the article by Kircher, Himmelman and Schiller was published in 1990. If we look at the evidence that's been growing in emergency medicine literature in recent years, we can see that one of the first ones was that by Lyon, Blavis and Branham, who published in 2004 the sonographic measurement of the inferior vena cava as a marker of blood loss. And this is one of the earlier studies linking uh, these variables. And then around the same time, Reports were emerging in critical care literature, such as the intensive care unit, of the respiratory variation in the inferior vena cava as a guide to fluid therapy. Spend a little bit of time now looking at how we might actually obtain the views of the IVC. And I'm going to go through the two common probes that you'll be associated with in critical care work. This is the cardiac probe, so a phased array probe. Uh, and here you can see it's in a longitudinal plane uh, along the line of the IVC uh, and again just a slight change in orientation to give you a better idea of where the probe is in relation to the patient. So in this particular view you can see that the IVC is running into the right atrium as shown and just to orientate you we can see the left lobe of the liver, pericardium here to reiterate again, IVC and uh, right atrium. And for those of you that are more comfortable in using a curb linear probes and as an extension of your work with EFAST and trauma assessment, again, similar view, longitudinal probe um, over the IVC um, to give you a similar view. And I'll just spend a little bit of time just going through this again. So um, just to re-establish the anatomy, left lobe of liver, IVC uh, in the junction with the right atrium. And uh, just to show you that in dynamic phase um, you can see how there's movement of the IVC uh, and its relationship to uh, the pericardium and the right atrium. Sometimes it'll be important for you to actually orientate yourself where the IVC is running and this is a, a very useful trick when you're first starting off to uh, assessment of any patient to work out the orientation between the uh, so that you know in a transverse plane where you're going to line up your transducer when you orientate in a longitudinal plane. So just running through this you can see that the uh, hallmark uh, landmark if you like is the vertebral body casting a dense posterior shadowing with the aorta uh, just to the left and uh, immediately adjacent to the vertebral body and here you can see a relatively well filled uh, IVC in a transverse plane. So where to measure the IVC and uh, there's agreement now that the, the most 
reliable measurements should be taken within two centimetres of the entrance to the right atrium and we'll, we'll look at a couple of views of that shortly. So here we are in a uh, using M mode, uh, M mode if you're not familiar with your machines will all have an M mode on it uh, and looking at the uh, longitudinal plane using a curvilinear probe along the line of longitudinal line axis of the IBC uh, and the junction between the uh, uh, right atrium and the IBC. So there's agreement the IBC should, should be examined uh, the junction between two to three centimetres quarterly of the uh, right atrium and vena cava and this is critical in terms of your assessment of not only the diameter of the IBC but also in terms of uh, assessing collapsibility of the IBC. So again just to re re reiterate what we were talking around earlier the left lobe of the liver uh, M mode uh, coursing down through the IBC um, and uh, again the junction between the IBC and the right atrium. Now sometimes it'll, you'll see that some people will talk around uh, using M mode to actually assess uh, the collapsibility of the IBC and in this particular view you can see that uh, on this axis is time and on this axis is distance and you can see that with normal respiratory variation there has been a change in the caliber of the IBC and this provides you as a way of measuring objectively um, how much collapse there has been of the IBC. Again, similar view, um, just demonstrating the uh, normal phasic variation in the IBC volume. Now if we um, just um, go back to um, this, we'll see that the algorithms for estimating either right atrial pressure or central venous pressure have been known for some 20 years and this is an important one for you to uh, take notice of because it's one that you'll be able to use in your clinical work uh, once you become familiar with uh, a look at the IBC. So while people have uh, cutoffs for diameters of the IBC, in clinical practice you'll find that once you've been looking at many IBCs you'll develop an eyeball effect of ones that are uh, look normal or ones that are significantly undervolumed. So I'll just run through this in a little bit of detail. You'll see that uh, the IBC that's small, in other words less than 1.5 centimetres, and I'll reiterate that these are in relation to adults. This is not children. In children the colour of the IBC is uh, dependent on age and uh, there are other indices that are used in children. So this is in relation to adults. If you see a normal IBC between 1.5 and 2.5 centimetres um, with greater than 50% collapse, then the right atrial pressure is on the low side. If you see it between 1.5 and 2.5 centimetres uh, without collapse, then uh, it's normal 10 to 15 millimetres of uh, mercury in the right atrial pressure. And again, if you see a dilated IBC uh, with less than 50% collapse, so minimal variability, then the right atrial pressure is estimated to be uh, elevated. If we translate this now to uh, CVP, you can see that uh, where the IBC is uh, less than 20 millimetres with more than 50% collapse, then the CVP is low, where it's less than 20 millimetres with less than 50% collapse, then uh, it's around 10 centimetres of uh, water, and uh, where the IBC is uh, increased in size, more than 20 millimetres with less than 50% collapse, the CVP is likely to be of the order of 15 centimetres of water. And then in the distended IBC, um, with minimal variability with respiration, you can see that the CVP is likely to be raised. So to summarise this quite important point, it's imp is that in patients with low intravascular volume, the inspiration to expiration diameter ratios change more than in those patients who have normal or high intravascular volume. And this is what's quite critical and quite useful 
in uh, bedside assessment of intravascular volume. Now, for those of you who like measuring things, you can see that the collapsibility of the IVC can actually be documented by the diameter and expiration minus the diameter and inspiration over the diameter and expiration to give you a ratio. And again, just to uh, run through uh, the collapse of the IVC uh, again in M mode, I'm just illustrating that there are two axes, um, depth this direction and time in this direction, you can see that there is uh, variability in the diameter of the IVC. Now another useful dot point is that hypervolemia is increasing likely with the IVC when the diameter is less than hours. one centimetre. The larger the IVC corresponds to a CVP of more than 10 centimetres of water. Now the caveats in this particular scenario are that ventilated patients, the respiratory dynamics are reversed. And I'll talk briefly about ventilated patients uh, in the next few slides. Also be aware that diuretics and vasodilators will influence the uh, IVC. Now, what are the pitfalls? Um, despite the fact that uh, when you start off you think how could anyone confuse the aorta and the IVC, remember the population you're dealing with uh, are unwell and the aorta uh, may actually appear to uh, um, collapse as well. So it will be very difficult for you sometimes to actually distinguish between the two, which is why it's important to get into the habit of looking in a transverse plane and making sure you're lining up on the uh, correct vessel. As an aside, the aorta is thick wall, it's got branches, may help you to differentiate uh, which vessel you've lined across. Sometimes you're going to cut obliquely through the IVC, and again, this will vary, give you uh, uh, variation in your uh, assessed diameter of the IVC. Not as critically important if you're looking at it in terms of a dynamic change, but again, may actually cause uh, error in your assessment. If you measure in the wrong area of the IVC, and remember I've spent a little bit of time talking around the appropriate place to measure, you may actually see more collapsibility the more caudal you go in the IVC, and that again may cause you to have a, uh, a, an inaccurate assessment of the IVC volume. You may actually have a poor view, and again, uh, in these patients, uh, it's sometimes it's worth trying a right lateral intercostal view, and in some it may actually be impossible and this, for that reason I'm going to talk a little bit around uh, using the uh, assessment of the JVP as an adjunct in assessment of volume status. Now in terms of limitations, when the IVC uh, positive pressure ventilation you'll see that uh, you see a reverse in the pressure changes you would expect and also in right heart failure valvular disease, pulmonary hypertension, uh, again the assessment of the IVC will not be uh, valid. Uh, and in patients who have increased intra-abdominal pressure, the IVC is not going to be an accurate reflection of their true volume status. Just to reiterate, those who've actually got increased intra-abdominal pressure, be it from obesity, abdominal trauma, post-laparotomy, the assessment that you make of the respiratory variation of the vena cava may not be accurate. Now, sometimes it's important to actually uh, go back to basics in those patients that are tr markedly obese where you can't gain or there's some other reason why you cannot get an adequate view of the uh, IVC. And again, looking at the uh, um, internal jugular vein is uh, an appropriate way of doing it. You may want to start at uh, sort of a 30 degree angle. Remember these patients, uh, the reason that you're actually doing this is because they're assessed to have a degree of hypervolemia. You may want to start at the 30 degree angle rather than a more acute angle. Um, with a linear array transducer, uh, find the internal jugular vein in the short axis and then move into a long axis plane. And veins that are distended with a high closing meniscus will have a higher CVP. And again, uh, practice on those patients who are well um, so that you'll actually get a better feel for those who are uh, hypervolemic. Obviously the limitations of those in trauma patients uh, and the critically unwell who uh, you cannot uh, move for uh, those reasons. So 
just looking at the internal jugular vein uh, assessment, you see that in, uh, in a transverse plane, you're looking for uh, a foolish uh, internal jugular vein, and then you will move up the neck until you actually see the vessel beginning to collapse, and that will give you an idea of uh, uh, the point, if you like, where the uh, jugular venous pressure uh, is at its maximum. Just reiterating that again, so start low uh, and then move uh, higher until you actually reach the point where you start to see the uh, internal jugular vein collapsing. Um, in this particular case you can see quite a distended internal jugular vein, give you an idea of the volume status is actually uh, the patient's relatively well volumed or perhaps even over volumed. I alluded earlier to the ventilated patients and the situation as we've said is that the, the, you see the reverse and the physiological changes you expect in the IVC. There's been work done that suggests that the absence of a significant respiratory variation means that the volume expansion will be ineffective in the majority of cases. The respiratory variation that's thought to be significant is around the area of 12% variation in the IVC diameter, it may be worth a trial of fluid in those patients. In those who do not display that degree of respiratory variation, then volume expansion uh, as assessed by IVC may not be useful. Just to go over again that algorithm and just to keep it in your mind that these are the, the values that will give you some idea about clinical assessment of patients and uh, the likelihood of volume expansion uh, benefiting uh, their hypertension. Those who've got a large IVC then the CVP is likely to be raised certainly above 10 centimetres of uh, water. A caveat just to, re just to make the point, ventilated patients again caution in the assessment of those and diuretics and vasodilators will flinch the IVC and in other subgroups. So in conclusion, clinician performed assessment of the volume status of a patient can be undertaken rapidly with bedside echo and will provide useful information in directing further clinical management. Practice on those that are well so that when you encounter the critically unwell you'll have a better idea of uh, standards of normal. Thanks very much. Um, suggest that you integrate this talk with those on the site and uh, look forward to catching you at a course soon. <laughs>